voice in He's here. Okay, I would like to welcome you to the honors project presentation and the capstone presentations for the fall semester 2021. My name is Dr. Heiser, and we have guests online that are uh, perhaps uh, coming from outside of Presbyterian College, but we are uh, streaming this from Presbyterian College. I'd like to invite up my colleague, Dr. Jackie Sumner, to introduce our first presenter. And uh, uh, okay, right I'll stand in front of the camera. Underway. This is very weird. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Are you awake? Yeah. This is the weirdest thing ever. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to present uh, Highland Gonzalez, who I advised her project for summer fellows this past year. And the title of her presentation is Mexican Women and Social Perceptions of Women in Post Revolutionary Mexico. Is that right, Adam? Did I memorize that correctly? Okay, all right. As Dr. Summer said, my name is Hadam Gonzalez. My summer research is on Mexican Revolution, women in post revolution in Mexico. How the revolution changed social perceptions of work. And so, my overall topic was women, their roles within the revolution itself, their roles in building a post revolution state. And how this changed social perception of women, which I defined as what society expected them to, how society expected them to participate within society, and then sort of the stereotypes that arose as a result of their participation and those expectations. And so this led into my research question How and what ways did the Mexican Revolution change social perception of women during and after the fact? And through my research, I came up with a working thesis because my intent was to make this an honor project. So my working thesis was Mexican women's roles expanded beyond traditional roles and stereotypes of mothers and wives created by Mexico's patriarchal society. And because they created new roles and rights for themselves in negotiations with government and society. And so leading into this, I'm going to go into the historical background of my project, which is the Mexican revolution itself. To sum it up in a few words, the revolution started in 1910 as a way to Overthrow the dictatorship that had been in power for over 30 years. And their overall goals were to increase suffrage and to introduce agrarian reforms, particularly land redistribution, things along those lines. And women were actively involved during the majority of the revolution, of all of it, in various ways, including but not limited to Soledadas. These were the army camp followers. They cooked for the soldiers, they cleaned up after the soldiers, they even performed basic nursing duties. Without them, the army would not have been nearly as efficient as they were. It sort of took the place of an official cook or an official nurse, things of that sort. Another way women were involved was that of soldats, female soldiers. They fought alongside men, sometimes even leading battalions of men. And then there were nurses in both official and unofficial capacities. And then sort of intellectual revolutionaries. These were women who wrote propaganda, they wrote detesting or detracting, or in support of different faction leaders within the revolution. And so as women participated, there came the rise of different stereotypes and results. These were not wholly flattering and usually not flattering. And the first example of that is La Anita. She was a soldadera who, yes, she participated actively within the revolution, but she was more valued for her beauty and femininity rather than playing active roles of revolutionary. 
And then we have one along the lines of that. La Valentina, the Gadachi, this is a female soldier. She actually fought alongside men. She turned with men, sort of like one of the guys. But she was never portrayed as being happy with that role, even though many women were very, in reality, happy with that position. And these, these stereotypes show up a lot in Mexican media. An example is a movie from after the revolution, like the Gadachi. She was a woman, she was a female soldier. But she was portrayed as wanting more than that. And this is sort of an example of how these have showed up in Mexican media. And so going into this, I want to highlight the sources I looked at during my research, getting into this photography. Most of the actual like serious look at this came from like the 80s and 90s, because most of the sources that came out directly after the revolution negated women's roles, often portraying them as only following their husbands and sons of the battle versus the active participants exercising their revolutionary agency. And so most of the more actual documentary evidence comes after the fact, closer to now. And a lot of these sources also look at perceptions and stereotypes of women during this time and half. And I want to highlight two sources for you today that are very useful in my research. The first is Soledades in the Mexican military. This book was by Liz Gonzalez and published in 1990. She looks at Mexican women's participation in armed conflict throughout all of Mexican history, starting with pre-Columbian times and following with independence, the revolution, and then present day participation in conflict. And she argues that all Mexican women, Mexican women regardless of social class or time period, I like by the fact that soldiering has been a shared a shared act between women all throughout Mexican history. And then the change in roles of Mexican women throughout these conflicts directly resulted in changes in stereotype imagery that showed up during and after the fact. Also impacted the Chicano literature and symbolism as well as the world. Another book I want to highlight is Revolutionary Women Post Revolutionary Mexico. This book was by Jocelyn Olcott and published in 2007. Olcott looks at the women's suffrage campaign after the end of the revolution and the creation of women's movement within Mexican society. She also grants proposals with the concept of revolutionary citizenship. She looks at the definition of what it meant to be a citizen in post-revolutionary Mexico and who or what revolutionary citizen was, what it actually means. And she found that it was very based on context and geographic location, something that was more experienced rather than a legal definition. And she found that it was inherently gendered. Being a revolutionary male citizen was not the same as being a revolutionary female citizen. And she delineates that very well. And through Mexican women's participation within these different suffrage campaigns and movements came the rise of new stereotypes. We have soledadas and the soldado stereotypes from before, but we also have new ones called La Pagada, La Chica Moderna, and Mary Macho, which I'll discuss more in depth later in our presentation. And so moving from the secondary sources, I want to get to the primary sources of the fact. I looked at newspaper articles, artwork, pictures, interviews, and memoirs. I'm going to highlight a few of those for you today. The first I want to look at was actually the first source I looked at in my research. That was The Rebel by Lenore Villegas de Mano. This was a memoir published posthumously in 1994. Villegas was the founder of La Cruz Blanca, which was the official nurse brigade for the Revolutionary Army. She uh, followed the army from the border as they descended down in Mexico City. And they set up Nurses stationed in hospitals along the way and trained local women in how to perform basic nursing abilities so that they could work there and stamp it as they followed the Revolutionary Army. Um, during her, as she writes, she also cites many examples of other revolutionary women she met. For example, a, one woman was Maria de Jesus. She was both a soldier and a spy for the Revolutionary Army. She mentions her often. And she also mentions a woman who's a soldier named Adelita that she cites to be an example, sort of like the prototype for the stereotype itself. And another primary source I'd like to highlight is this image right here. This has been cited as being from 1913 to 1914. This woman's been identified as being Carmen Robles. She was a coronel in the Zapatista Army. As you can see, not only was she defined in her stereotypes by being an active military participant, but she's also wearing men's clothing. She's pictured wearing pants, 
Should have the church carries a gun both of them, which are not even normal for women at this time. And then it also includes the hat, but she's still wearing earrings as well. And she's a sunny example of many other women who were actively fighting as armed participants. And another interesting source I want to look at is this article that's actually from the Abbeville Press and Banner, which I thought was interesting. The news of the revolution in Delaware, South Carolina, which considering lots of people were kind of obsessed with it at the time. <laughs> since, um, it's dated July 15th, 1914. This article describes what it does as being quote unquote patient, hardworking, and faithful, but it also highlights Mexican women's roles in war throughout history, which I thought was very interesting for the time period. And it also highlights the fact that these women were not necessarily wives of soldiers. They could make arrangements with men to like, for pay, they would provide these services, you know, cooking, cleaning, stuff like that. And I found that to be very interesting for the time when you consider a lot of the sources that came out for the revolution in David and Charles for women. And so, Moving from the sources I looked at, I want to get to the research I found that actually sort of answered my question. And so starting with that, I want to look at the building of the revolutionary state. So they based it off the Constitution of 1917, which is one of the most progressive documents for its time period. It highlighted social reforms within the document itself, looking at things like Not necessarily bird or that was implied, but not really executed till later. But interesting things like labor reforms and things like maternity leave, equal pay for equal work was actively written down, not necessarily in practice, but it exists in the document somewhere. And the government used this to enact different education reforms. They did art programs to instill revolutionary ideals, different hygiene programs, and the alcohol campaigns. And this document was sort of the basis for all that. And alongside the government's participation, women's organizations also did similar programs. They also ran alcohol camp, anti alcohol campaign, chains, labor campaigns, along with movements for their own suffrage. And through women's participation with the government and society in order to enact these reforms. They sort of moved beyond the expectation of motherhood because they had been some active participants within the revolution and the state after the fact. But at the same time, women had to play into these stereotypes to get some of these installed. For example, the suffrage campaign is a great one because in some states you could say, like, hey, I am a citizen, I have equal rights, or I should have equal rights. And you could grant that. But then with working with the federal government, you had to play in the fact that like, I'm a mother, I have children. In order to best and act as best for my children, I need to be able to vote and get cast my opinion in a legal matter. And on the federal level, that works. And so, as I mentioned earlier, the participation of women within the state can arise in stereotypes. One that was the sort of the ideal expectation was that a lot of you know, this was a selfless woman who wholeheartedly devoted herself to the new revolutionary state and instilling revolutionary ideals within her children. A ambiguous stereotype was that of La Chica Madera, like the modern girl. She was good in the fact that she was able to have a life outside her children. She was in the domestic, outside of the domestic sphere. Like she worked, but she was also a good mother to her children. But at the same time, she was seen as a negative because she played into the globalization of Mexican culture that Mexico was trying to avoid. It's like imported hairstyles, bobbing her hair, wearing imported clothing. That was not seen as the revolutionary ideal. And then we have the most troubling of all that is Mary Macha. This is a masculine woman. This is what Mexico is actively trying to avoid creating through giving women rights because. It was a common misconception that giving women the right to participate in politics would either masculinize women or feminize politics. And this is what Mexico was trying to avoid, and they thought that this would actively make that happen. 
And so as the years went on, more people gained more participation in the revolutionary state. That did not extend to everyone. And this is exemplified in the Easy Island of Friday of 1994 and Preciso that the Tista de la Revolution Nacional, the Zapatista Army for National Liberation. This organization came out of Chiapas, Mexico. They were an indigenous movement looking to gain their ancestral lands back, their ability to govern themselves, sort of the autonomous, autonomous from the state. And the organization heavily employed active involvement of women. Women were involved in the initial armed uprising. They could equally rise in the ranks with men. And women were also involved in the political political aspect as well. On the right here, we have Kamada Ramona. She was the woman that was selected to represent the organization on a national level during negotiations with the federal government. And then women were also voted in to leadership positions within the local realm as well. And then women are actively acting as their own economic agents within their own communities, setting up community stores, running group land activities. And the platform of the organization itself made women's rights actively part of it. They passed the Revolutionary Law for Women, which is where Indigenous women got together and decided what rights have been denied to us and what rights do we deserve, such as rights like the right to education, which was not always granted to them within their own communities as a result of local damping down of that. And then sometimes even basic rights, the right to choose their own husbands, the right to decide how many kids they have. And the goal is to gain autonomy in that way. And this is a study example of how the revolution's liberals were fixed on class and race. Because a white woman in 1994 would not have to have done this to get these rights. It's very apparent. And so some conclusions I think gained from my Research is that social perceptions of women have moved past that we've seen wives, as wives and mothers that can be revolutionary agents, but not necessarily always in the best light. New tropes arose as a result of women's participation within the revolutionary state after the fact. And there's much work to be done, both with building women's historiography, as we can see lots of the stuff came from like more recent times, source wise. And we need to work on building up the before that. And much work needs to be done with making sure that these rights, revolutionary rights, reach all women and not just white women. So, if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll entertain questions from the audience. I'd like to invite the people viewing online, if they would like to ask a question, to do so through the chat, and we will read that question to uh, Highland. Question? question? Daniel Bailey and uh, Austin Scholl congratulate you on a good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I find it it's very interesting. Uh, and I, I find it interesting you really getting at this question of kind of how revolutionary was this revolution? So, you know, obviously we see some change. In, you, you gave some examples of what would be seen as very progressive revolutionary change is, is what would account for the fact that these voices of women who participated in the revolution as you noted you know we're not publicized we're maybe not silenced but you know not until recently have they have they actually had their voices heard um it I guess my question is, is, you know, how do you explain that given the revolution? Is it just simply that it's politically motivated, but they're just not willing to go this far and recognize that women are breaking these molds? Based on the research I did, it seemed to be a combination of both. Because the state itself, like, funded publishing of, like, memoirs after the fact, but this was, the majority of these were male. There were like a handful of women that came out, but it was mostly focused on men. And like, these were my experience of soldiering. Like I was such a great revolutionary fighter and focusing more on like revolutionary men's ideals, like these strong active participants. And the women 
that did, but it was much more, I was not an active participant. I was just supporting the troops in a way. And so women like Viegas and some of the others she mentioned kind of got lost in the shuffle. Viegas actually cites the fact that she was sort of acting out of the sort of preferred gender stereotypes where society was as the reason she wasn't able to get her memoir published until after she died, or at least before the fact. It was like the stereotypes, I'm breaking them, yeah. and this is why I can't get this published. But just this power of the patriarchy that just is, it, it is <clears throat> resilient to the revolutionary forces. That... Even, yeah. though, even though they cited examples like we want this to be more progressive, sure. actually enacting that was a lot harder. Are, are any this is Bob, are any of these women political rivals in the post-revolutionary world? Is that true? None of the ones I found. Okay. Did, there okay. were some women, like leaders of movements, that were active. They tried to be active politically. Yeah. But because they were women, it was far right. too actively get into certain <clears throat> political circles. But they were much more working on the publishing and trying to get their voices heard that way versus being able to actually enter political circles. Cool. Dr. B.C. Yeah. Hi, Mr. Thank you very much. That's also fascinating. Um, do they have a I think in some ways, uh, uh, similar perhaps to the question that uh, Dr. Thompson asked, what? Did the revolution actually advance women rights more than more than age development did anyway that you see in the US, you know, women get more rights over time. Yes, they have to struggle for it. But did the revolution actually accelerate this, or is it just a regular progression that we see that is almost independent of the revolution? Did the revolution actually make a difference? Based on what I've looked at, I would say it was more of an over time versus the revolution itself. Because most of these that were enacted were after much more staggered after the fact versus like an immediate the revolution's over for granting people right situation. I thought you could see that question there. <laughs> Did the revolution make a difference? Yeah. This one that like you know okay. some of us, including myself, are trying to write books about um, to try to answer the question. I mean that is the crux of the you know that's the, the that's the real challenge of, of us those of us writing next to history today is like trying to figure out did it I mean and it's an impossible question to answer. Yeah, um, correct, right? Um, but Highlands, but what I, I mean, we had so much fun doing this research together last summer. Um, we, we really did, we had so much fun. But the realization of how can sources were on, the, you know, for, on women's perspectives, I mean, it was like very important. Um, <laughs> was, go please. Yeah, it, it was hard to find them. Step one, step two, it was hard to find them. And, English, which is, I'm, yeah. I'm not the best Spanish reader, so I was doing like Google Translate situation. But then from things directly after that time period, there was also like a copyright issue for some of them. Mm -hmm. I wasn't able to access them. So if this project had gone forward, I would have liked to look at that and find a way to have access to those. Not pandemic was not the, the pandemic of the health. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I'm actually along the same lines. <laughs> yeah, that some would say there's no answer. So, um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm just curious. I guess think about it as the almost the anti-revolutionary aspects of the revolution, right? That the revolution is pushing for certain changes, but opposed to others, right? So they go use people or groups or individuals who can move in that direction, but not necessarily advance their interests uh, separately. Um, so I'm just, I guess I'm more, I'm interested in what you saw with the, um, what do you call them, the Maramacha, mm -hmm. um, stereotype, this idea that, um, women are going to, what was it, they going to the masculine women or politics, right? So that this idea that there's, uh, if you could just talk about that a little bit and how that fear, I guess, of what these women can represent if we give them full recognition as, Actual being actually being revolutionary as opposed to being um, a supplemental, supplemental revolutionary. Yeah. 
uh, in days and I know that there's, if there's something that, that makes tweaks in how much or how little, you know, revolutionary change is actually taking place through them. All right, Connor, it seems to be. It wasn't like everywhere in Mexico. It was on a federal level for sure. But like when you get into like regional politics, there was more openness for actual entry to political society. One great example is the Yucatan, the state of Yucatan. Women were actually, this is the first state that passed women's rights to vote. And there were women actively participating in politics there. But at the same time, it's more of an outlier when it comes to the rest of Mexico. So there were some places that were, they weren't afraid, I guess, of the stereotype or the standard. But Mexico as a whole, I think it was laid more towards the expectations and like the stereotypes that they wanted to have or the ideals at least and sort of in the rebranding of Mexican society as a whole like this is what we want the ideal Mexican man to be versus this is what an ideal Mexican woman should be a participant but not too much is that, is that an answer sure yeah absolutely yeah that was just fascinating the imagery and, and that word branding is key right yeah, I mean, it, yeah. It was a whole, Mexico is basically like, we're going to rebrand how we see ourselves, how the world sees us. We're going to try to be a new Mexico, but at the same time, they kind of went against that because they actively kept some of the stuff from pre-revolution, like we want women to be only active in these ways, versus the idea of Mexican standard for men is always active participants in society and things like that. Yeah, correct. Yeah, and when it comes to women, you know, like, no, you know, they had those, yeah, yeah, that's right. But I think, and if you look today, and what's up, uh, one of what's going on in Mexico right now, and if you last year and this year, in the midst of the pandemic, the massive women's rights protests taking place all throughout cities in Mexico. Um, my friends that marched in Mexico City, and um, like, they're all marching against the harassment and abuse, mm -hmm. sexual harassment and sexual abuse of women that is widespread in Mexico. I mean, so, you know, it's kind of a really long way to go to get past the stereotypes that are so well. Okay. All right. Thank you, Highland, very much for your presentation. All right. Well, Get a minute, uh, Grayson, if you'd like to get set up, we'll get you started in about a minute or so. I missed that. Oh. Sorry. Sorry about that. <clears throat> All right. All right. Well, I'd like to welcome you then to the kind of second part of this panel. And that is the uh, capstone on the uh, capstone presentations on uh, various topics related to the Crusades. And our uh, first presenter, uh, Grayson Horton, will be introduced by uh, Tanner Wilhelm. Okay, I'm first like to introduce uh, Grayson Horton, who will be doing his uh, capstone on spirituality and military community in the first place. Okay, so as Tanner so graciously um, introduced, uh, my topic was again on spirituality and military duty in the First Crusade. And my research question is Did spiritual fervor or military duty play a more significant role in the success of the First Crusade? 
And my thesis statement is, although spiritual fervor was a key fixture in the mind of the crusader, military engineering played a more significant role in the success of the first crusade due to the tangible victories it produced as a result. So to start um, in terms of historical context, uh, the Council of Clamont in 1095 was the start of the First Crusade. Pope Urban II uh, proclaimed a sermon that the First Crusade was the will of God. He claimed that the Muslims were oppressing Christians in the region, and it was necessary for the Christians to reclaim Jerusalem to ease the suffering of the Christian brethren. And he highlighted uh, both a spiritual and material aspect of the reward for the crusader who would take up the cross. First, he promised the remission of sins for the crusader who would um, take the crusade out of the ocean alone. And there was also the promise that Jerusalem would be a city of prosperity and a location where these crusaders could experience a new life um, away from Europe. Um, the first reaction to Pope Urban II's uh, sermon was the People's Crusade. Um, in the spring of 1096. This was the first wave of the uh, First Crusade in which it was led by Peter the Hermit and many other prophetic-like figures. Um, they displayed sort of um, these different visions that they had received from God and, and miracles of sorts um, that the people interpreted as being divine um, aid. And it, spiritual enthusiasm was the driving force behind this first movement. Um, it was promised by Peter the Hermit and his contemporaries that God's divine aid would be on the side of the people throughout um, the, uh, the phenomenon movement. Um, but this enthusiasm subsided rather quickly after suffering uh, brutal defeats at the hands of the Turks and the movement subsided uh, shortly thereafter. Um, then came the second wave of the First Crusade, which was the Crusade of, of Knights and Nobles. This was in the fall of 1096. Uh, it was, rather than be composed of peasants, and just a motley group of individuals. This one was composed of knights and princes. Um, it was far more organized, and these major leaders, uh, when they arrived at Constantinople in 1097, were able to negotiate with Alexis I um, for supplies and for reinforcements um, when they uh, would first set course into Nicaea. So that brings us to sort of the major battles um, of the First Crusade. The first was the siege of Nicaea in 1097. So with the aid of the Byzantines, they captured Nicaea after a maritime um, and a land siege in around six weeks. Um, it was, it was, a, it was a quick, quickly executed and, and well done. But as soon as they had captured the uh, city, um, the prince that had been away, the Muslim prince that had been away quickly um, returned to take back the city, but they were able to stifle his assault um, after uh, taking uh, refuge in the fortress. So after the siege of 1997 came the siege of Antioch in um, 1097 through 1098. Uh, this siege, rather than six weeks, lasted six months. Um, it was marked by starvation and dehydration throughout, though, because the Crusaders were not able to break through the walls of the city for a very extended period of time. And as that uh, siege dragged on, the Crusaders realized that um, a Muslim prince, Kerboga, was approaching with a massive army um, in comparison to theirs, and fear and desertion began to increase. So as this happens, Bohemond of Toronto, he manages to negotiate with one of a, a Turkish emir on the wall of Antioch and basically convince him that if he let the crusaders into the city, that he give them a, a position of prominence um, in the new crusader state. And it, again, it was, it was a deceptive bargain and once he's able to manage to do so, the Crusaders uh, get into the city and find refuge within the walls. But this still doesn't um, alleviate the fact that a massive army is approaching. So as the army approaches, uh, the Crusaders find the Holy Lance that had pierced Jesus' side on the cross. And it, this galvanizes the troops and reinvigorates them for battle. And they ultimately defeat a numerically superior force in Kerbogo's army um, and uh, solidify their control of Antioch. So after um, conquering Antioch, the siege of Jerusalem in 1099 um, was ultimately the, the end of the First Crusade, but it uh, was an initial assault that lasted around five weeks, um, but they weren't able to really uh, break through the, the outer walls. Um, so there was ordered a retreat and a religious procession that was conducted in which 
uh, the Crusaders visited many different holy sites around the city. And this again, uh, just more, uh, gave, gave the troops a new morale and they were able to then uh, break forth and achieve victory um, shortly thereafter. So in terms of the uh, historiographical context, I examined two different sources. The first was Armies of Heaven, the First Crusade and the Quest for Apocalypse by J. Rubenstein. And this source, uh, Rubenstein argues that um, spiritual zeal was, was present even before the Council of Vermont in 295, which most historians would say was the beginning of the First Crusade. And that is the zeal was kind of driven by, by the idea that the end of the world was approaching, that Jesus was going to be arriving back on earth and that his, his uh, returning point would be Jerusalem. So the goal was they would need to get to Jerusalem as soon as possible to sort of prepare the way um, for him to arrive. So, and he argues that this apocalyptic fervor was what spurred the Crusaders to victory. Um, key moments was, was the finding of the Holy Lands in that religious procession in Jerusalem that in each of those instances, the Crusaders kind of had their backs against the wall, but in those moments, it allowed them to, to push forth and continue even though they were um, facing difficult times. Um, and he also argued that because Armageddon was at hand, it was, it was a, they needed to, again, arrive at Jerusalem um, in a timely manner and, and take it back for the sake of, um, for the sake of uh, uh, Christendom. So then the other source I examined was um, Victory in the East, the Military History of the First Crusade by John France. And this source, rather than saying apocalyptic fervor was what spurred the Crusaders to victory, France argues that it was uh, the success of the First Crusade was due more to the versatile nature of the Crusading armies in comparison with the Muslims. Um, and the difference for France um, in comparison with Ruben Sinus, he argues that the Council of Command was a political move rather than a spiritual one. That while Ruben Stein would say the Council of Command mark, I guess, the channeling of all this apocalyptic burden that existed before it, France would argue that. Um, the Council of Rome was more so a political move in the sense that the papacy wanted to assert themselves in Christendom in the, re in the Holy Land and kind of rival the Byzantine Empire that was rising in strength and influence. Um, and so that, that, that was an interesting comparison there. And then the other, the other facet of his argument was that they did this, the, the Crusaders had a far more adaptable infantry than the Muslims that they were that, that they were able to, through the leadership of these um, princes, uh, face challenges head on and get through those challenges more easily. And so delving into my argument, um, it's, it, it's clear that spirituality um, is, again, a key fixture in the mind crusader uh, demonstrated through the primary sources that each of these sources was written by clergymen. So it has to be examined again that divine influence would certainly be attributed uh, in each of these instances, regardless of the outcome. Um, so it, it's actually interesting that even in instances where the crusaders lost, the, the sources would, would say that, that it was kind of down to the attitude of the crusaders before. It would, they would say it was because of our sins. It was because of our sins that God was not on our side in that battle, and therefore we lost. Um, in, in victory, God was on our side because maybe we had done something or it, it, it was just down to, again, um, God's divine faith. And so, again, the Council of Clement was, was the springboard for this uh, religious zeal. Um, and it, it, it was very important because it motivated the princes to combine their relig religiosity with their desire for war. So this was important because whereas the princes already had a desire where they existed, and there was just this, again, this, uh, there was a pre-existing class of knights that existed throughout Europe before that, and they were very keen to for, for uh, to act on their warmongering. Um, this uh, the Councilor Kermont and Pope Ruben's uh, sermon ultimately allowed them to combine uh, both their um, devotion to God and their desire for war. And this was key because then the princes could provide the manpower experience that the People's Crusade did not, just through those prophets, um, that they were able to provide the supplies and manpower for that to happen. Um, and yes, again, the, the People's Crusade, it was driven by fervor rather than um, having the necessary organization that the second wave of the First Crusade had. Um, it lacked the discipline, especially in when they first traveled to Constantinople. They didn't have the supplies and they lacked the planning in the first place. And many of the people that uh, took up the cross in the People's Crusade suffered from dehydration 
um, and starvation. And so they looted the countryside and then aroused the rage of Nicene Turks. And they quickly uh, rallied their forces. Um, and it, it, it was extinguished before it ever got started. So they would so recklessly throw themselves into battle, believing that God would be on their side and take care of it. And they lacked the organization to um, be successful in those moments. Um, and then in comparison to the Crusades, the Knights and Nobles was given far more planning and attention. There were numerous instances, one of which in Italy, there was uh, I mean, almost virtually every single um, coastal air, uh, region or coastal city would provide support um, to allow the Crusaders to cross um, the Mediterranean into, uh, into the Byzantine Empire. Um, and many of these other princes were, were able to accumulate their forces and, and, and resources um, to make this happen. And they also, these princes also had the leverage to negotiate with Alexius I for supplies. Peter the Hermit found favor with Alexius I when he first tried to negotiate with him um, in the People's Crusade, but he wasn't able to uh, achieve the same sort of um, bargain that the, the princes were with Alexius I. Okay, so in, in, first, in terms of the first case study, the siege of Nicaea in 1097 um, was, again, that there, there's a key aspect to remember that Again, spirituality is always going to be present. So they start they start the siege on the day of Jesus' ascension, the historic day of Jesus' ascension. And yes, um, they, they, the sources attributed to this, but the, in the initial reckless assault of Nicaea, the forces were, were peppered by arrow fire and they were nearly wiped out. And if it wasn't for some of the uh, princes in the, in the midst of that movement who were calling the troops and calling them to retreat, many of those troops could have been, um, they could have suffered more heavy losses. So in comparison to the People's Crusade, this was a, a, a wise move um, for the princes to, to act so uh, swiftly. Um, and to sustain the siege, they were, again, through their bargain with Alexius, they had the supplies and they had the ships to sort of stage a, a more comprehensive siege on all sides of the city walls, rather than just going through the central gate and suffering um, uh, a greater arrow fire from that distance. Um, and a, another example of just the superiority of their um, so just the supplies that they had was an instance where these crusaders had these great lances from horseback, and it cleared the path of the Muslim infantry, infantry that was in front of them and allowed for the infantry of the crusaders to, um, to sweep them behind. Uh, it, the Muslims just didn't have the cavalry that the, the crusaders had, which was a key um, factor in in uh, the development of, of this siege. Another key aspect of what in, that they existed throughout each of these uh, different sieges was that the Crusaders had siege towers and, and rams and scaling ladders that allowed them to scale the walls and damage the walls of the city and let them uh, break forth. So um, again, in 1097, they ultimately conquered uh, Nicaea um, and allowed them to have that platform to let them go further into the Holy Land. So then the siege of Antioch was about four months after the siege of Nicaea. The Crusaders believed that they would reach Antioch in about five weeks, but it took four months um, due to some other battles uh, in, um, in between. But they initiated the siege with a furious assault once again. Um, the sources kind of say that the, the princes had very little control over the troops in those initial moments of battle because there's this sort of fervor that existed amongst them. So they, they attacked recklessly and again, suffer some heavy losses, but Tancred, uh, one of the princes, um, recalls that force and the garrison of Antioch swiftly follows. And when they follow them, he then crushed them in the open field of battle with their, with their uh, um, horses and, and, and lances. Uh, and, the, and the Muslims were again, not prepared for this because the Crusaders had a large, larger force awaiting outside of that. Um, and another instance was as this uh, siege continues, there was a castle on the periphery of Antioch that was sort of run down and was crumbling. And Tancred was able to revitalize this along with the help of his troops. And this was used as a staging ground as a stage of siege for those next six months. But three months into the uh, siege, the, the crusade nearly ended um, because there was just this immense amount of uh, just starvation and, and dehydration that existed and uh, many desertions um, increased. And so the princes, being aware of the situation, decided to um, organize a mass, and the Crusaders uh, did this together, and it reinvigorated the troops and allowed them to sustain it for the next three months. Um, but it just demonstrates again that 
just the awareness of uh, the princess to the situation that with without that the, the, the siege could have very swiftly ended um and so as um six months passed by Bohemian um again in a key moment uh, negotiates with Bruce the Turkish mirror in the wall and gives the crusaders access to the city um and as Kaboga's army is approaching it was a very key time that he did so because they would have been crushed outside the walls with the with the Turks inside the walls on the other side, so they would have nowhere to go. So as they made it into the city, it was an perfect opportune time. Yet again, though, the Holy Lance is discovered an even more opportune time. Um, and regardless of the credibility of whether this was um, the Holy Lance uh, that appears Jesus' side or not, it was essential um, to motivating the uh, Crusaders to fight up a numerically superior army and rush forth um, from the city. And so they rallied around this Holy Relic, and the Crusaders were able to defeat the numerically superior army, not only to, due to that sort of um, that motivation from the lance, but also because the Bohemian devised uh, a scheme where he split the army in half. So basically, which was which was again a huge gamble because they were already at a, a numerical disadvantage. They split the army in half. Part of the army remaining in the hills behind Antioch, and part of the army coming out to face straight from the city. And the army in the hills uh, put Kerboga in a position where he, he was uncertain of whether the army in the hills hid even more troops than, than um, they existed. So he believed that, again, from this situation, that, um, that there were far more crusaders in the hills and that, that he may be um, not ready for, for, for the force that would be arriving from there. And so he was uncertain, and his uncertainty uh, translated to his troops as well. And so this uncertainty led to, um, again, their, their uncertainty in comparison to the conviction of the Crusaders to uh, be so confident in their uh, assistance through the, through the presence of the Holy Lance led to the victory of the Crusaders in that moment. Um, and then the siege of Jerusalem in 1099, um, again, there's an instance of a furious assault right from the beginning, but it led to little success once again. Um, but as it progressed, they led a coordinated assault um, in the next five weeks, but they lacked the necessary uh, siege equipment and, and siege towers to sustain the siege. So they withdrew and they conducted the village procession, um, marching to the different places around um, uh, Jerusalem. Uh, and there's a key instance of the source of tribute, the Tancred, sort of his devotion um, in, that, in, in the moment of the village procession inspired the troops to continue fighting. So this again a key example of leadership being being key um, in this movement, and so they they then attain more resources in this pause of religious procession, uh, attain a large amount of timber to build siege towers and scaling ladders, and once they did so, they then uh, set forth in the siege again, and as as it progresses, it was clear that they were uh, achieving far more than they had in the first five weeks, and in the midst of battle, they were um, able to kind of make some more makeshift bridges to breach the walls as well. Um, again, demonstrating the versatile nature of, of the crusading force. And um, in July 7th of 1099, or July 15th of 1099, they were able to finally conquer Jerusalem um, and finish uh, what they had started. And so in conclusion, um, each of these sieges demonstrates a pattern of military dominance, tactically and in terms of flexibility. So it's example, in the Siege of Antioch, tactically, it was a huge gamble to split the force in half, but ultimately it deterred Kerboga from being more confident in um, his approach to Antioch. In terms of flexibility, there were just many instances of, <clears throat> of having to adjust to the landscape and the surroundings, and the, um, they were, the princes were able to do so. Um, in terms of leadership, in every facet of the movement, um, there was a uniformity to the movement, even in the instances where fervor uh, kind of led to the troops recklessly attacking the city in the first place when they arrived. Um, there was a fervor present. I mean, there was a th there was a leadership present to to kind of keep them uh, in control uh, later as as the siege progressed. In comparison, the lack of leadership of the People's Crusade, which led to it ending rather quickly. And then again, spiritual influence was consistently present, but as those moments of reckless fervor kind of illustrate, there the results were very underwhelming. Um, and ultimately, it, it, it can be uh, gleaned that these patterns of military dominance were what led to the success of the movement.
And then these are just some of the selected sources um, from our research. And that's, that's it. All right. If uh, Grayson will entertain questions, and for those who are watching online, if you could uh, submit your questions by the chat, we will read them to him for his answer. Questions? <clears throat> yes. Oh, sorry. Grace, uh, very interesting. Um, really kind of fascinating to look at uh, military history. Um, the very end there, it, well, it, throughout the whole thing, you're, you're playing off the sort of spirituality, the fervor versus obviously kind of the, the reasoned approach to leadership to war. And at the very end, you made that comment that, that the spirituality, uh, obviously, when we see it pour out in these moments of fervor and they're not successful on the battlefield, but, but how, would, would you grant that that spirituality perhaps maybe had, uh, uh, you know, you talk about a six month siege. I mean, what is it that, could the spirituality, in other words, be an aspect of that ingenuity? I mean, you seem to indicate that yeah, at times it's this outrage, it's this violence that's not focused. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you also seem to indicate that that very same theme is what this leadership will tap into at key moments mm -hmm. as a way of maintaining the organization, the direction, uh, the morale. Yeah, uh, so, you know, I don't know, perhaps just, I, I think it's interesting to break these out, but perhaps we'll look back at this, recognize, uh, maybe that spirituality actually has, plays more of a foundational role that doesn't just appear when you have this raging group, but, you know, it, it's what explains why these people are willing to march hundreds of miles and camp out for yes. night after night after night after night. And so, um, yeah, I don't know. Just that the way at the end you said how it, how it, I don't know what verbiage you had, but it, it, it didn't lead to victory or, or it, it, was, it was underwhelming. And I just, just to kind of rethink maybe where to go forward with this, to think that, okay, maybe this also manifests itself in a way. Just as a question. Um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> that's out. It wasn't really a question. Uh, just in, in response to the last presentation, um, I'm guessing there's not, but I mean, are there, are there sources, are there women, are there people that are left out of the crusades? Do we, are we only hearing about these people from the leadership or, I mean, do we actually have, you're, you're smiling, so you know the answer to this. So well, go ahead. Well, <laughs> it's interesting because Tanner actually, in his research, he's going to talk okay. about women in, in, in the crusade. Um, okay. I mean, certainly people are left out of this. I mean, okay. again, as I mentioned, all these sources were written by clergymen. So it's going to be from uh, a perspective of, yes, we're going to display these princes in just a glorious manner. I mean, it is sort of propaganda to, to a certain extent. Um, yeah, and I clarify did. this. They're Christian clergy. Oh yes. Okay. Absolutely. Right. right. There's no Muslim Christian. Yes, I mean mm -hmm. there are there are Muslim sources as well, right. but they they don't delve so much into what the Crusaders kind of did, and and, and the battles. It's more so of <clears throat> yes, um, what they did was terrible. Yeah. Well. The Crusaders. Yeah. yeah. I mean, obviously, you're gonna present it from my experience. Okay. So, <laughs> um, does that answer your question? Yeah. 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 Okay. No. Um, Other question. Or comment, perhaps, yes. as the case may be. Especially because you actually look at the whole crusade, you know, so it's not just one battle. Thing. And I know to make your point repeatedly, each of these battles that was ultimately the leadership, you know, made a big difference. But I think as Dr. Alfred pointed out, as you have mentioned several times, you know, these moments of you know crucial difference are always um, somehow moments of faith, you know, where they find the holy man. Just at that moment, and um, you know, I, I like that you actually talked about the story because it's just even crazy that you know they, they start digging, and then all of a sudden, you know, after they dig for like I don't know 17 hours, this one guy jumps in and pulls out the land, like, oh my god, <laughs> you know, so I mean, there's no question here that they, it's like very convenient moments where you know these things are uh, used to them rather than 
one aspect of that though, which has been, I mean, obviously, this is a project in itself, you know, it, it's enormous size. I wonder if you widened the focus a little bit and looked at also at what would the Muslim world actually have experienced when these guys come in. Because another potential argument you could make is yes, it's the military leadership, and yes, it's certainly fervor, but it also is actually disarray in the Muslim world at the time where they simply don't see the crusaders as big of a threat as they actually are. Um, and because they are divided, they have a very hard time responding to this threat. And so it takes them a long time before they are actually all united in kind of resisting this crusade. So do you think there might be another um, potential angle where you could say, yes, it is really very leadership. Yes, it is potentially, but that left them in the source of, you know, the, the, the faith. Is it also the, just the context in which they are just lucky? They have to like break and then the Muslim world is not united as they were later on. Oh, absolutely. And <clears throat> Again, there are many different, in terms of the historiographical argument, there's, there's, there's Rubenstein, there's Francis, but there's many others that say, yes, it was the disorganization of the, of the Muslim world that contributed to such an easy movement. And, and as you see in some of the subsequent crusades, uh, the Muslim world quickly awakens to this yeah. threat and, then and it kind back. of um, takes back a lot of those, of those cities. Um, yes, it, in, it kind of in my question, it's certainly a little bit two dimensional in that sense, I'd say. Um, because there are so many different factors that you could you could recognize as leading to this uh, movement. But I wanted in particular to examine kind of this dynamic between um, military kind of tactics and spirituality. Based on your sources, that is, you know, the most important observation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Grayson, real quick from Dr. Campbell, any evidence in the sources that suggest looting and property? taking was an equal motivation to religious fervor for individual crusaders. Yes. <laughs> That's too. And see, in terms of motivation is a whole nother, a whole nother topic um, in itself. Uh, yes, they, there, there are many different sources that attribute it as such. Um, it's, it's difficult, again, to discern from these primary sources when they would say, yes, these troops were motivated by religious devotion alone. To figure out what did motivate them, and so yes, there, there have been many different sources that have um, have discussed that kind of question. I I would say that just kind of goes outside the bounds of my question, so I don't necessarily want to touch on that as much. But, <laughs> but yet, certainly, th there is evidence to say that looting and, and pillaging was a was a key aspect of what motivated them. So it's difficult to discern that. But. All right, Grayson, thank you very much. Grayson will introduce our next presenter. So you can just go ahead, go ahead and get set up, Bridges, if you need to. Reeves. It says the same basic thing, doesn't it? Oh, we added a couple things. I'm sorry, colleague, I'm losing. Uh, <laughs> like I'm just, I'm losing. This is, and it's for, for, not only that, but it's permanently Can recorded. <laughs> Apparently not. It appears no. <laughs> okay, so the, the next presentation, um, Reeves Bridges, um, he's going to be talking about the Spanish Reconquista and the reactions that um, came from it. Okay. Good morning, everyone. As Grayson said, my name is Reeves, and I'm going to be presenting today on reactions of the Arabic and Western clergy, lords, and soldiers, specifically in Islamic Spain, in response to some of the increased religious conflicts at the time leading into the Second Crusade. So I have a couple of key terms to note just to make sure that we're all kind of on the same page going forward. 
specifically with the Arabic world, whenever I mention it, I'm specifically referring to empires and kingdoms run by Islamic leaders in the Middle East, Africa, or the Iberian Peninsula. The Western world, in turn, refers to empires and kingdoms run by Christian leaders here in Europe. The Iberian Peninsula is referring to the southern tip of Europe, which consists of modern-day Spain and Portugal. The Crusades is a reference to a series of religious wars fought across Europe and in Jerusalem between Christian and Islamic forces. And then Christendom is a term that many people may not be familiar with. It is the political unit of Christians across Europe, which was mobilized by the First Crusade in 1095, as Pope Gert called on them. So the research question that I really wanted to dive into is, were there any significant changes that reflect the attitudes from Western Arabic soldiers, clergies, and lords to the increased religious conflicts in Spain following the First Crusade? If evidence of such shifts does exist, how did these feelings change the course of Reconquista efforts, mobilization in the Iberian Peninsula, and the Second Crusade as a whole? Uh, my thesis for this, and really what I'll argue throughout, is that the Western clergy was better able to motivate and justify their war efforts, which allowed for more support from the nobles and soldiers that they appealed to, than that of their Arabic counterparts who struggled to mobilize in an effective effort. I have a little bit of historical context for us to look at just leading up to this. Really, this starts with Arabic kingdoms from northern Africa spreading into the Iberian Peninsula following the fall of the Roman Empire and Visigoth tribes taking over the area. In 711, General Tarek's armies will secure major military victories for their kingdoms as they first push in to some of these key strongholds across the Iberian Peninsula. In 713, the Treaty of Tudor will be signed, which protects Christians as well as allows them to openly practice freely and essentially creates them as being a protected minority in some of these Islamic kingdoms. In 722, the Reconquista process will begin in an effort to retake Spain, but it's not able to get any substantial footings in that short amount of time. And we'll see that it's a continuing process that never truly has a beginning or end. It just kind of evolves in nature. In 1031, a propaganda campaign will begin, which favors the Apostle James. Around this time, he will also be given a different name, being James the Moor Slayer, which we'll see later on is relatively very important to inspire people to take up arms. And in 1095, as I mentioned, Pope Urban II calls for the First Crusade, kind of mobilizing Christendom and allowing for the Christian unit to fully be engaged. Looking at some of the historiography and modern-day historians, this first book is Kingdoms of Faith, a uh, New History of Islamic Spain from Brian Catlos, and he argues Islamic Spain to be a highly spiritual and virtuous kingdom. He largely tries to depict it as almost a paradise where everyone is able to live harmoniously. Some Islamic citizens will choose to leave the Islamic Spain as there are increase in the religious conflicts so that they may remain nonviolent. But evidence such as the Treaty of Tumir proves a degree of acceptance in this day-to-day -day life, as Christians were allowed to open freely and practice freely, but they also constantly work together in markets and neighborhoods. Catlos does acknowledge conflicts, but he disputes them from being solely religious in nature and instead tries to look at some of the political and social aspects that can rise from that kind of living and mixing together. In contrast to that, the myth of the Adulation Paradise by Fernandez Morea, it's going to look at a lot of the executions, crucifixions, and other oppressive behavior as clear evidence of religious persecution in Islamic Spain. It's going to look at Muslim, Christian, and Jewish sources under, under Islamic rule in medieval Spain, but he largely will begin to argue that the crucifixions especially are going to indicate a religious context which will contrast the ideas that Catalos presents of looking at things past that, such as the religious, social, and political aspects instead. Uh, Morea is going to argue that Reconquista is a Christian retaking of Spain, which allows it to return to a morality, and he uses that basic decrease in crucifixions as a pretty convincing argument for it becoming more moral. This source offers the concept of a convincia instead, which is basically the idea of working together just out of convenience, as opposed to working together from some kind of religious tolerance, which may exist. Uh, Maria is going to argue by looking at more of a broader scale that there is no harmonious society because it's just a constant series of minor conflicts 
throughout the Reconquista process. As we're kind of shifting gears and instead looking at my research specifically, I want to propose this first quote from Bernard, the Archbishop of Toledo. He argues and basically decrees, all Christians who defend Christ and other followers will attain the remission of all sins like those entering the life of a monk or hermit after, of course, completing confession. This papal influence on the Western forces simply cannot be overstated. As the driving cause of the First Crusade, it was the church's mobilization of Christendom that is the key to understanding the increased conflict that rose in the Iberian Peninsula. Looking in specifically at some of the Western clergy reactions, there was a great risk in allowing Christians in Spain to take the pilgrimage to Jerusalem and leave their home as they would essentially give up the entire Iberian Peninsula to these Islamic kingdoms. The church does attempt to stop the early waves when Pope Pascal II forbade the Castilian monarch from abandoning their land, but they soon waver and there is evidence that suggests that it was ineffective to even try to stop them because there was just so much passion for wanting to go and take up the cross. The church will soon waver and instead they declare the same indulgences to be given to anyone who serves in the armies of God, regardless of that actual crusade or the actual movement to Jerusalem. It's just that idea of taking up the cross and being, being willing to fight for God, that is what is the key to salvation. We also see the propaganda of James the War Slayer, as I mentioned. It starts to inspire many to take up the cross based on his life, specifically the Codex Cal oh, I'm so bad at this word. Calix Dennis provides a handy guide to visit the grave of St. James, which they moved, and it also includes accounts of miracles that pilgrims have encountered along the way and that they attribute specifically to James. This kind of idea of an increase in the miracles that are seen is something that a lot of people wanted to experience for themselves, and they begin following that and going and kind of taking up the cross themselves, hoping to live a life similar to James the Morse Slayer. Once there was that clear enemy for all Christians to recognize following the First Crusade, the church was able to work to unify with some of the Spanish churches, which had become largely disconnected in the late 12th century, and it creates an even stronger force to go against these Arabic empires. Shifting gears and looking out at the Western lords, kings were very tempted to take up the cross and leave their kingdoms to retake Jerusalem, despite those clergy attempts that we discussed to discourage such actions. Peter I of Aragon, specifically in 1101, he's really seeking glory. That's kind of his primary motivator, is feeling like he wants to give back and be famous. But their attention gets turned to Zaragoza by Pope Pascal II, and they begin to come up with the idea of the Terra Per Hispanium, which is a new route that will instead go through the Iberian Peninsula to reach Jerusalem, as opposed to going through France and kind of working your way down. They'll go down and then work over. This new idea really makes it easy to link both fronts of the crusade from both a Eastern and Western world and it increases the support of Islamic Spain's conquest. Monarchs such as King Louis VII take up the cross, and it's a huge motivator for others to take the cross as well, as they kind of want to emulate such a powerful monarch at the time. James I, King of Aragon, even goes so far as he's doing this that he will go into the Iberian Peninsula, but he will specifically wait for permission to retake cities and kingdoms until he's speaking to the archbishops so that he knows he's working well within the church's restrictions and what they are actually agreeing is going to be good for the efforts. And then looking at Western soldiers. At one point, the Western forces had more than 350 individuals in at least one of the two crusading fronts, and soldiers were now able to achieve these crusading indulgences without taking that full pilgrimage to Jerusalem, which makes it easier for them to take the cross. We also see a lot of them begin to retake up the cross thanks to St. James the Moor Slayer beginning to appear in battles in 1231 and 1299 alongside these soldiers. He is technically attributed with about a thousand kills, which teach their own. Other inspirations for soldiers taking the cross do start to rise throughout this. So it's important to see that it's not just religious in nature. There is a widespread anger and this kind of resentment towards the Moors that had taken the Iberian Peninsula, and there have been largely oppression 
leading up to that point that they wanted to answer. You also have the general spoils of war as every person. There is evidence of pillaging or looting. And even in some other points, you have specific things given from those lords, such as being able to get out of taxes, which would apply to their wives, their children, and it would go for years to come that they were completely excused for this if they were taken off the cross. And also, one of the best ways to inspire any man to take up and go to war is women. A lot of women began to support it following the First Crusade's success and encouraging their husbands and spouses to go straight into battle themselves and have similar success. We do see one interesting thing that I wanted to point out. Some of these soldiers may have been led astray and felt as though they were marching directly into a physical heaven. As opposed to going into Jerusalem as they would go through the Iberian Peninsula, they thought this was the pathway to go straight to heaven. And there's this kind of differential between the spiritual and physical rewards, which may not have always been largely understood by the Western soldiers. Changing gears and instead looking at the Arabic clergy. There's a odd challenge that the Western forces don't have as they now need to rally support to fight the same Christians that they've now spent years trying to teach the acceptance of their faith and protect them. Uh, specifically, Hazen in the late 11th century, he's going to start trying to preach about the dangers of Christianity. He depicts it as being contradictory in nature and will go so far as to describe it as vile and dangerous in nature. He looks specifically at the Gospel of Matthew and the discussion of it being the sword of the land in contrast to also being a peaceful religion. And he says that there's no way to trust Christians. He encourages the government to become harsher on Christians. Of course, the lords didn't listen out of fear of kind of disrupting that peace they were seeking. And this is kind of that first clergy aspect that we see attempting to make a change. Following the First Crusade's defeats, we'll see from Tahir al he's going to launch an effort to increase the support from the Iberian, Kingdom, Iberian kingdoms. And he's going to start to argue that the Crusades have been much longer than what a lot of people and modern historians will agree to, saying that it started in 1085 when the city of Toledo was taken, instead of starting at the actual uh, Council of Clermont, where, quote, Urban II calls for it. Also, we see due to the isolation, they had spent so long working out of convenience due to that lack of resources that they would have from other kingdoms around, that they were hesitant to risk any kind of sudden uprising and trying to argue that we should oppress the Christians more, that especially with their preaching, they don't want to kind of throw the rest of the city into danger. Looking at the Lords, kings at this time, there is evidence that they saw the conflicts as a chance of redemption or reinforcing their power, but these kings are very few and far between. The majority of them were still having that same mindset of, it hasn't broken yet, so let's not fix it. We more so see from judges and nobles placing the restrictions on Christians, but that's kind of counterintuitively may have pushed more Christians to take off the cross. We can especially see from market inspectors who oversee those markets where there is a large mixture of the three Judaic faiths, that they were meant to oversee a proper relation existing between Muslims, Jews, and Christians. These proper relations are essentially oppressions. Muslims were not allowed to touch them, dress the same as them, sell cloth without actually displaying it as being touched by Christians. And it's largely just ways to ensure that Muslims will see themselves as superior to Christians. Women were also banned from going into the quote unquote abdominal churches because of the evildoer priests of Christianity who were just so untrue to their own faith that they saw them as dangerous to be left alone beside women. We also saw that there were some citizens beginning to be conflicted by this because we're putting more restrictions onto the Christians and saying that they're so evil, but they're still a protected minority and they're still allowed to be here. We can largely see that in the Lay of the Sid, which is a poem that came out about the same amount of time. It depicts this kind of danger of beginning to trust your lords who are not going to have your best interest in faith and remain virtuous to the faith. Switching gears, because of that, we're going to look at some of the Arabic soldier reactions. We do have some soldiers who just leave, as I mentioned. Others just stop trusting their lords and kind of start to look out for themselves. 
But what we see for the ordinary Muslim citizen outside of the major cities is that they'll end up getting stationed in forts alongside the frontier. And it's largely reorganizing the Islamic Spain community as a society organized specifically for war, kind of making sure they're ready at any point to go into battle. There is a call to North African kingdoms for reinforcements in 1212, but by that point, it was just too little too late. The Catholic kingdoms had grown too strong to resist in the 200 plus years since the First Crusade. And the religious zeal of the North African soldiers just wasn't shared by that of those in the Iberian Peninsula. There was increased oppression and persecution of Christians after any victories that would happen thanks to those North African soldiers. But at the end of the day, it was just too little. They came in with that same kind of vigor that they had at the beginning under uh, Tarek in the late or early 8th century. But it wasn't shared by those same people in the Iberian Peninsula after being taught out of convenience to just accept Christians and get along with them. When looking at why the change happened and why there was this kind of loss, I argue it is the Treaty of Tudmir and the protected minority status. Just for over 500 years at that point, they had been taught, do not fight with the Christians. And now trying to shift gears into that and saying, just kidding, we're going to try to wipe them out, it doesn't work. Also, there is a degree of that kind of fire and some of the leaders being gone. The leadership just was not focused on military conquest as opposed to being focused on maintaining their actual economic power. In conclusion, the Islamic clergy were unable to launch adequate campaigns to try and justify any religious warfare. Arabic nobles and soldiers lost that spark that they once used to break <coughs> into the Iberian Peninsula. And overall, the Arabic forces were not able to effectively react to increased conflicts, which in the end will cause their downfall. Looking at the Western side, in contrast to that, the Christian clergy launches a large campaign even before the First Crusade to increase support for retaking the Iberian Peninsula. The introduction of the Terra Pair Hispanium gives nobles the ability to fully engage in Islamic Spain while also continuing to take up the cross on their pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And soldiers believed that they were saving their own souls, specifically as they took up the cross and making it go straight into heaven. It made it more attractive for them to go into war specifically. This is a selected bibliography, just presenting some of the sources that I used. Specifically, the Chronicles uh, in the first one is a primary source, which depicts a lot of my religious Arabic clergy sources. And the third one being from King the King of Aragon, James I, the Conqueror's Chronicle. It's his biography for going into war. The other two are secondary, but they were very beneficial for kind of providing some of the soldiers' inputs, which wasn't largely covered by primary sources, which may be something for future research to try and attempt to find more of. I'd also like to say thank you to Dr. Heiser, the History Department of Presbyterian College, and everyone for listening. The continual support has been key to comprising this research project. And I would like to apologize. Some names are very hard for me to pronounce. <laughs> I didn't get them right. But I would now like to open the floor for any questions that you may have. What, uh, <clears throat> questions for Reeves, please. And those of you who are listening online, if you could submit your questions using the chat, that would be helpful. Questions? Yes. Good morning, thank you very much. There's also a fascinating idea, right, that you provide a practical perspective, you know, so it's not just like one uh, one group of people just telling us what's happening in the agricultural viewpoint, but I think you provide a very good analysis of what that means, like what the result of it. How do you research across cases that would take either of these uh, groups? In fact, what, for example, what do you the Jewish community? It's actually quite long to say, think of the event that you actually see that the kind of the crusades would be dangerous to them uh, as well. Do they see the, um, you know, do they see that as a concept because the uh, Muslims would, you know, be, be taken down a peg or two? I don't, I don't know how they would see it. Do you come across any sources that would fall outside of this? Definitely. I would kind of just skim through them just because it didn't necessarily fit into the restraints of my research. But from what I was able to see in the research that I did do on it, it seemed as though Judaic communities were largely happy whenever things would be known, just because they were largely oppressed by Islamic Spain, similar to what Christians faced. Like, yeah, see that ultimately might not be, like, you know, the ultimate outcome might not 
you know, it was just kind of that alleviation of some of the restrictions. A lot of those same oppressions that went towards the Christians also would apply to the Jewish community. Okay, Dr. Nelson. Um, uh, Dr. Nelson, you <laughs> first question, two of them. Well, maybe two of Matthew again. The first one is just with St. James the Moor Slayer. Um, I know. Is this, I mean, has this is this a figure that's been reevaluated? You know, have you run across uh, in recent scholarship? You know, perhaps we should call him the Moor Slayer, or perhaps <laughs> needs to be reevaluated. And, and I guess the second part is, is you know, what do we what do we take from studying this that is applicable to? And what's the takeaway that we can apply to the modern world? What is what does this help us understand, or or, or perhaps a, a a lesson that can be applied when we're looking at, you know, because you're dealing with essentially, you know, two different groups that are competing over the same areas. Obviously, something that's still seen in this world today. So, those are my two questions. I'll stop. Absolutely. Uh, I only found one source that specifically in a modern context really talks about James the War Slayer. And it does have that same kind of idea of like, it's kind of messed up to still call him that. <laughs> and there has been kind of a return to referring to him as an apostle to go back to trying to be like, he's a peaceful messenger. Don't worry about the thousands of deaths that he may be the cause of, but he's very peaceful. Largely, it looks like those are Arabic sources that still kind of bring that up and look at it in a way that's bad. And that answers kind of the second question, too. That same Arabic source kind of explains this fear of another sudden attack from Christianity, because it was just such a sudden shift in the eyes of many Islamic cultures, where it was just, we're living together, we're peaceful together, they're killing us, they've taken all the Iberian events for that. And it's, some people still believe that that fear exists, where there's just going to be another sudden attack based on religious preference. So... Oh. So looking at these, we see times of, of living together peacefully, we see times of conflict. What, what's, what's, the, what's the inclination? What's the natural state? I mean, are we, are we foolish to try to recreate in this world this multicultural community based on tolerance? Or, you know, do you give in to these more radical views that obviously are all sorts. It's definitely a hard question to kind of dissect, but it seems like the natural state is that kind of idea of working together out of convenience and kind of everyone's able to prosper when everyone gets along. It's just kind of the varying degrees that humans in nature kind of go more religious or less religious at a time. In Islamic Spain, especially in efforts from the Arabic clergy, they tried to make that idea that you are Islamic first. That is the first aspect of your identity is that you are a Muslim. And it just kind of varies based on what clergy is teaching at the time and what people are willing to listen to. So we can all live together except for the occasion of one. Exactly. <laughs> There's a comment, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but that gets to Dr. Chiki's question, which is, I mean, it, it, it's, I also think I love how you presented both sides here and looked at both Christian and Muslim sources. I thought that was really cool, um, especially for Spain, which is such an interesting place, right? And, and this myth that endures, especially about Andalusia, right? That, that Southern Spain was, was like, you know, utopia, but, I mean, as compared to the rest of the world, it kind of was in that for hundreds of years, Jews, Muslims, and Christians didn't kill each other. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like, historically speaking, like that's a pretty big deal. And it really, you don't see that happening again until pretty much now, you know what I mean? So that and historically, even if comparing different parts of the world, it's pretty incredible, the kind of religious diversity that was able to exist under Islamic Spain. Absolutely. And so your comment about, the, about Jewish people, about how they really, wanted to not live under the restrictions of Islam is interesting in light of the fact that 500 years later, mm -hmm. all the Jews and Muslims, of course, would be expelled from Spain under Christian rule. Definitely. I think it's, it's just kind of one of those, it's essentially a pendulum where it's yeah. very peaceful and people are starting to be like, wow, we're so oppressed and have all these restrictions. Yeah. We need to change it. 
bloodshed for a while, and then you have another person in charge who will also put those same restrictions yeah. and expel people, and then people will get tired of that, and you have more bloodshed. And so, it's just switching nature. So I guess my question is for you, Reese, like, and this is a genuine question that I don't actually know the answer to, uh, but like in terms of the differences between Islam and Christianity, like what is it about the religious, the actual religious difference between these two religions that Christianity is kind of obsessed with proselytizing, right? With mm -hmm. with trying to convert as many people as possible. Definitely. Whereas, is this is this the case under Islam? I mean, is this do we see the same kind of thing happening under Islamic Spain? I mean, from my research, what I've most been able to see is that there's kind of a difference in the idea of conversion in the Christianity sense. Whereas Islam is more so through large families and kind of taking okay. an area and land like that and okay. then slowly converting. I think it's kind of that idea that in order to be a good Christian it is going out and spreading the gospel and then converting as many as you can. Right. Whereas in an Islamic context, it's more so have more children, spread power, okay. become more powerful. It's not exactly something I look deep into, but that's just from what my sources were able to see that I can kind of conclude. Okay, good point. The early stages of, of the modern faith we have the very same as the of the idea of the present faith. But what you're looking at here is the established religion, you know, this thing that has already you know, you know, changed its ways in some way. So I think you're looking at a different perspective than the one that you would be in the invitation of certain days. Yeah, right. Right, 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 right. Interesting. Other questions? The one I have for you, Reeves, is the Muslim faith does have the Christian, the way that the Christians, um, the church presented this to the Crusaders was a way to gain spiritual um, reward, be that in uh, matters related to their sins or in an afterlife, in the afterlife. <clears throat> uh, and they were successful in motivating crusaders using that those those that message um islam also has a teaching that um dying um, on a battlefield in defense of faith was a way to enter paradise and so how is it that uh the muslim clergy was not able to tap into that in the same way that the christian clergy was Definitely. And it was one of the questions that I really tried to dissect through it from the best of my abilities and what the research that I've seen has been able to really argue. It's just that it was a little too late for it to be effective. The idea of being a martyr is introduced from the Arabic clergy. By the time that they introduce it, you've already had a large amount leave those kingdoms just because they don't want to have to fight, basically. Or you have a lot of them that have already kind of lost their substantial power because the Crusades were so active and able to inspire so many people to take it up. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Reed. All right, I think that what we can do is take about a five minute uh, breather and uh, we'll come back at 11.05. <laughs> How are you Thanks for the pause. <laughs> Am I allowed to have this up here? Water? Yeah. Like snow? Yeah. Yes. Grayson, you want me to exit out here? Uh, you absolutely can do that. Screw me against that. Screw me. 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 Screw
History department, they care. History department, we care. All right. Yeah. Yes. Our next presentation is Mr. Mike Malinowski presenting on the ninth temple. So uh, my capstone presentation of research revolved around the ice and water like reset and really focusing on the transition from uh, a low order to a low order. Now, at the beginning of my research, I had a complex question that uh, evidence and the research led me to this question, which is how did the military religious order of the Knights Templar go from an order charged with the monumental task of protecting Christendom to an order that was ostracized by Christianity and ultimately abolished? This leads into my thesis, which is the Knights Templar moved from a beloved military order to a hated one due to the loss of their original purpose and overwhelming military humiliation. Now, before we actually get into the evidence of the research, it's important to have a historical context for the period and 
kind of who these Templars interacted with. So the first, the first order that was actually around in the Levant was the Knights Hospitallars. And this order was charged with the protecting uh, of pilgrims by serving them when they're sick, serving them when they were injured from their travels. And really those who came with no money, those pilgrims were also taken care of. The militarization of this order began around uh, 1160, which allowed them to assume new roles such as structuring land settlements and frontier defense, which would ultimately characterize them as a military religious order moving forward. And then finally, they became an integral part of the Levantine infrastructure, really relying and helping uh, the pilgrims who feel safe and to help Christianity blossom. But when they did interfere with the Templars, it was with the Templars and then butted heads pretty drastically. Um, moving into the, another religious order uh, would be the Teutonic Knights. And this order was formally acknowledged in the 1190s and gained papal approval by the end of the 12th century. Um, they relied heavily on Templar precedent in establishing a governing rule, which outlined how they were to live, how they were to act um, in public, how they were to act uh, behind the walls of their uh, even fortress. And really, they also um, aligned with the Templars and Hospitalers as their organizational structure as well. Um, they did operate within the Levant, but they had more serious ties to the Germanic or Baltic regions of Christianity. Um, this was primarily because of the sponsorship that they had. It was all uh, revolved around the Germanic region, and that's where a lot of the Crusades were launched involving the Teutonic Knights. Now, towards the middle, 13th century, the 1250s, the 1280s, there was a period of revolts in this region that challenged the order's position. Um, this, would, this came in the form of Prussian enemies, mainly pagans who were still living in the newly established Germanic Crusader states. Um, and they really looked towards um, retaking the land previously occupied um, and conquered by the Baltic Crusades. However, nothing really came of this because there was such a large Germanic colonization push, with, uh, push within this region. And finally, we get to the historical context of the Knights Templar. Um, this order was revolutionary, combining the monastic and warrior lifestyles of this time period, and really focused on the protection of pilgrims traveling to the Levantine theater, also the protection of Christendom as a whole and spreading those values throughout the region and helping Jerusalem grow and prosper as an emerging city. Between 1119 and 1128, the Knights Templars remained relatively unchanged and almost disbanded this was really due to the fact that they had no resources. Um, this included land, wealth, and the political prestige that they would later gain moving forward. Um, the efforts of Hugh de Pans and St. Bernard of Clairvaux helped grow the order, both in the Eastern and Western theaters of Christendom. Uh, the efforts were primarily focused on the accumulation of money and ecclesiastical support. And it's important to note that St. Bernard of Clairvaux actually allowed Hugh de Pans to have an audience with uh, different kings, uh, counts, abbots, and um, other clergymen to help support this massive expansion. Um, and it's important to also note that this expansion really focused on gaining followers, but that was the prime objective to begin with. And then they would set up and uh, set off and to uh, develop a network that allowed for the management of new land um, and to spread ideals throughout the Eastern world. Um, and then the Knights Templars were revolution, I'm sorry, the order gained papal recognition in 1129 at the Council of Choice by Pope Honoris II, really solidifying them as an emerging military order and saying that these guys were here to stay and help Christianity. Now from the 1140s to 1180s, they operated in a complex, complex system of patriarchs which involved a shifting of alliances from uh, one, one person to the next. And this complex web of alliances would, uh, has an example of an early recorded Templar alliance with Emperor John of Constantinople, um, aligning against the interests of the Kingdom of Jerusalem. And the Second Crusade fostered even greater growth for the Templars and actually created a new role for them, which is international financiers. Um, however, this new role and their development of it could not outshine the embarrassing mishap of Damascus, which really highlights the fact that a miscalculated maneuver um, among leadership and the fact that this order was perceived as a superior fighting force at the time would not always be successful. 
Um, similarly, the siege of Aswan proves the same thing because even though the siege was successful for the Christian forces, the role that the Templars played in it is actually one that weakens or diminishes the overall um, the siege. And the Battle of Hattin in Jerusalem in 1187 impacted the order and Christendom as a whole. This uh, primarily focuses on the um, purifying practices uh, incorporated by the Muslim leadership to say, hey, we need to get Christianity out of here and have only Muslim relics and Muslim uh, artifacts and fortresses and things like that. And then finally, as we begin um, the 13th century, we do see a revival of Templar land holdings, wealth, power, and status. Um, this was on the back end of Pope Innocent III, looking at the Templars as a vassal that could be used to um, redevelop uh, certain Christian fortresses, finance certain projects within this uh, region, and to simply combat heretics or serve their original purpose. Um, the capture of uh, Damietta was the only winning outcome of this. However, it ultimately led to the slaughter of large Christian forces near the Nile and really did nothing else for the Fourth Crusade. It was only after Pope Innocent III's death um, that this that expeditions were sent to Egypt starting the Fifth Crusade. And then the, uh, in the Order's involvement in the uh, Battle of Jerusalem in 1244 and before me uh, also highlight the historical context for the Templars and the fact that while they were there and while they were active, um, their loss of these two cities uh, ultimately helped to solidify their position within the limit of the Levant as one of a declining order. And then we get to the century uh, ended with the loss of Acre in 1291, pretty much solidifying the order's fate and moving into their um, trials in 1307. Now, the historiography portion of this research focuses on Edward Berman's uh, The Templars, Knights of God, and Malcolm Barber's A New Knighthood. The primary difference between these two works focuses on the portrayal of history. For Berman, he highlights the uh, order as their roles of militants and financiers, and looking at their overall decline as one that is not as dramatic as history portrays, and in fact, it's more internal than anything. Um, he actually derives a theme of self-destruction that seems to characterize his whole approach to the Templars and looks, to, uh, looks into the order solely based on individual issues uh, denouncing any form or any suggestion that outside influence could actually have a play. Uh, in contrast to this, Malcolm Barber's A New Knighthood looks at the order from uh, outside influence, proposing the theme of inherent prejudice that um, the order could simply not overcome eventually leading to their downfall. Um, he utilizes source material from John of Salisbury, uh, which directly challenges papal privileges bestowed upon the order. And these, these um, challenges really focused on the combination of lifestyles, looking at the monastic and the um, warrior and saying how it directly contradicts what Christians believed and the overall mission that was to be served. And finally, the use of uh, William of Tyre's formation of uh, the Knights Templar. He shows how the order had eliminated pride at the beginning, um, but then loses sight of humility, which is a character, uh, a characterization stressed early in the beginning of the order's years. Now, moving into the endorsements of the order, um, primary source material helped me establish that this order did move from one being loved, um, endorsed by St. Bernard of Clotho and the praise of the knighthood outlining um, who this order was, what they should do, um, marking that this was gonna be a aggressive recruitment um, with initiatives forced to focus on how do we gain people that were gonna help advance Christendom. Um, he touches on the inevitable challenges that the order will face, and in doing so, outlines certain duties that they need to act on for Christianity in order to combat that. Um, and he also preaches that the sacrificing of their own lives for Christianity is a way for them to ultimately gain salvation. He also characterizes this order as a new type of militia in comparison to a militia, which is um, the militia is based off of knights acquiring a monastic lifestyle in order to further Christianity, uh, perpetuating a war against the infidel and ultimately gaining salvation. The militia would be the secular knights simply doing this for their own individual purposes. 
Um, similar endorsements of the early years include Hugh, Hugh the Sinner's letter, and this is this is the only account of his actual name. No one truly knows who this document was really written by. But this order, uh, this letter endorses the order addressing the many for faces the devil can take, and this is important to include because it outlines how the two plus should stay on track regardless of who they face within the world. That they're the they're the ones to protect Christendom and they're the ones to foster growth for the Christian faith. The Latin rule is similar to Saint Bernard of Clairvaux's in the fact that it outlines certain duties that the order um, has but it dives more in depth into the actual inner workings of what they're doing. Um, it involves how they should eat, sleep, pray, how they should act outside of the outside of their castles and fortresses, how they should act inside and things like that. And then the two uh, papal bulls at the end of this, Omni Datum Optimum and Militus Templi, really helped to solidify who the order uh, was as, as men. Um, the Omni Datum Optimum, in 1139 protects anything acquired by the Templars. This is gifts, money, food, what have you. If it's for the purpose of advancing Christian faith and Christian values, then the order can accept it and no harm, no doubt, no harm, no foul. It also highlights the fact that the Pope uh, is the only one who is to charge the Templars with anything. And the Templars are the only ones who, are, who need to answer is the Pope. Um, similarly, they're exempted from tithes and taxes, but they can't accept them. And that's outlined in this. And that kind of shows how the Templars begin to act uh, unchecked within the uh, Christian world. And then Militus Templi just encourages the protection of the order by clergymen and allows them uh, to accept donations, encouraging those clergymen to give to the Templars so that the Christian faith can be uh, preserved and advanced. Um, and then evidence, the themes that characterize Templar problems, the first theme is military humiliation. Um, the first siege or capture uh, would be at Asalon in 1153. And previously mentioned, this siege was successful for the Christian faith. However, the role that the Templars play in it, it kind of kind of flips because uh, it is said that the Templars had acted out of greed when they were breaching the fortress because they wanted to be there and they wanted to gain all the spoils from the battle. However, when breaching the wall, they actually were met with a pretty formidable force by the, uh, the lay people of the region and all the Templars were slaughtered, really highlighting how individual preferences and individual motives can really demean the, uh, the effect of what's supposed to happen. Uh, the Battle of Hattin in 1187 and Jerusalem of 1187 also highlight this. Um, the Battle of Hattin is where the Templars found themselves incurring massive losses and subject to an ultimatum, either choosing apostasy going away from the Christian faith or execution. Um, those who were captured and who weren't executed were auctioned off for Turks, um, to two Turks, either for execution or for them to do with it as they pleased. Um, and usually it also ended in execution. Those few knights who did escape uh, became Saracens and would flip on the Christian faith, giving uh, secret military tactics to the enemies trying to ensure that the Christian faith was not able to mount an attack or mount a defense that was formidable against these Muslim forces. Um, and then the loss of Jerusalem really in 1187 is really characterized as the beginning of the end for the Latin kingdom because it showed just how vulnerable this order was and just how vulnerable Christianity could be if not backed correctly. Um, and it's important to note for the humiliation theme is that the prisoners were paraded around these cities um, and events were written down to show how, how humiliating this order was, highlighting the portrayal of Christianity and the Christian forces as one that is broken and beaten. Um, Jerusalem also highlights efforts of enemy to purify and eradicate Christianity from the region. Like I previously said, any Christian fortress, any Christian relic, any Christian item pretty much was supposed to be taken out by Muslim forces to ensure that no one would inhabit the city or the faith could not grow. And then finally, finally uh, Laforby in 1244 and the loss of Jerusalem in 1244, now the leaders of the military orders were all slain after the loss of Jerusalem, along with the, all the brothers of the orders to ensure that the, no one would inhabit the city again, really pressing this issue of the fact that Christianity did not need to be uh, in this region at all. And then a few months later at the defeat of Laforby, 
the Egyptian Sultan uh, aligned with the Karizmians who were conquered by the Mongols in 1220, uh, were faced up against the Templars who were aligned with the leaders of Damascus in Karak. Um, unfortunately for the Templars, uh, Leforbi also ended in a loss because their alliance was disbanded and the leaders were like, we're just going to go ahead and get out of here before all of our men are slaughtered. Um, after this loss, virtually nothing could be done to stop the decline of the Christian forces within the region, really focusing on who the Templars were and saying that, okay, these guys are, these guys are here, they were charged with this duty, but nothing has come of it. In fact, we've lost, or we've had Jerusalem lost two times. And then the next theme would be the uh, loss of the original purpose. Now, the original purpose for the Templars was primarily the protection of Christendom and the protection of pilgrimages. Um, the William of Tyre contained in his a history of deeds done by uh, beyond the sea really focuses on uh, the religiosity <laughs> replace, uh, religiosity being replaced with greed. And this came in the form of different uh, roles that the Templars would take, such as landowners and financiers. These, these uh, primary sources that are in front of you, typical will from Alfonso, the first king of Aragon, gathering the crusading taxes in 1220, and the colonization by Moorish settlers of 1267, all aim to highlight uh, how these different roles uh, played into effect and how the Templars were affected by them. Uh, the will in 1131 grants the Templars everything that the king has. This included uh, lordship, sovereign rights to uh, the population, including the clergy and laity. Um, the gathering of crusading taxes in 1220 outlines the Templars as intermediaries and how they were directly involved within um, the crusading taxes. However, within this primary source, there is a, there's an excerpt that says, if money is not brought or if money does not find its home, then uh, these Templars are to be held responsible, kind of hinting at a sense of corruption that is kind of uh, moving into the, uh, the, uh, the order. And then finally, the colonization by more settlers in 1267. This outlines uh, the Templars and the landholding aspect of the Crusades. However, evidence points to the fact that these, uh, this order used a barter system where uh, the Templars would give a certain amount of land to a settler in the hopes of advancing Christendom, but they would want to receive more in the form of tithes, taxes, um, agricultural product that is produced from that land, things like that. They just wanted to be reimbursed a lot more than these settlers did because they were just lucky to be in the region and advancing the Christian faith. And then uh, finally, the Templars were selective <clears throat> and how they interact on behalf of papal and patriarchal authority. This also comes in the form of any one of these uh, primary sources. The Templars later in their history seem to develop a sense of uh, individualism where they would say, well, if this advances us and helps us, then we can help. But if it doesn't, we'll just move away from it. And then finally, a changed outlook. Um, this really looks at a one, one, one primary source from the end of Templar history. Uh, William Lamar's letter to the Council of Vienna in 1312 really highlights the transition from love to loathe. Um, it says that yeah, the order is characterized as one with a bad reputation. He even states that the, uh, the order has caused the Christian faith to acquire a rank smell and caused believers to waver in faith. Um, because of this, he ultimately advocates uh, for the immediate abolishment of the order because of these shameful and heretical practices. And really what this does is it characterizes the growing frustration among Christians, uh, especially in the end of the 13th century and the beginning of the 14th, but also looks at the middle of the 13th century as one where you can kind of see this transition pick up drastically to the point where when uh, Acker fell in 1291, it was almost the straw that broke the camel's back. And then um, the selected bibliography, like I said earlier, uh, St. Bernard of Clairvaux and the Christ of New Knighthood was really the first primary source to be looked at because it uh, helped to see, the, to see a beginning uh, for the Templars. William of Tyre, History of Deeds Done Beyond the Sea, really looks at that early transition from religiosity um, to greed. And then the secondary sources would be Malcolm Barber's The New Knighthood, used in my historiography 
just to kind of paint a, a deeper understanding of the history of the Templars. And then uh, William N. Goatsman's The Temple in Finance shows the active role of the Templars um, as a financier and how that ultimately affected them um, in the end. And now uh, questions. Okay, uh, Michael will entertain questions from the audience. If there are any questions from those who are online, if you could use the chat feature, we will read those to him. Oh, that's yes, awesome. sir. Okay, <clears throat> my opportunity to bring up the conspiracy. Oh, um, yes. No, I mean, it's in the Knights Templar, one of these groups that, you know, not saying there's any legitimacy to it, but you do hear this. It oh, up, it. What is it about the organization from what you've studied that that would that might lead one to believe that uh, you know, the secret organization continued on or that there are these conspirators? And what, what elements existed within the institution then? From the research, I would have to say that one, the development of individualism among the order, whether that be with the leadership or just the knights in general. Individual, individualism played a big role in how they developed in the 13th century. Um, the research showed and the evidence kind of points to the fact that they were very selective later on in developing who they were as an order instead of saying, you know, we have to protect Christendom, we have to help pilgrims in the uh, Levant, we need to do that and solely stick to it. When they began to uh, go after money and glory and things like that, that's where you start to begin to see a lot of um, charges that they were practicing heresy within their uh, order. Like, uh, I believe in one instance, I read that uh, in the middle of the 13th century, they were charged with um, the process of the kiss of the body, which pretty much means when they enter chapter, uh, they would have to kiss someone's body, a naked body and things like that. So I think that individualism is probably the biggest one that characterizes that um, conspiracy of, oh, they could possibly still be around. To what degree is their movement into the world of being financiers? I mean, just the simple fact that there's always these, I mean, we're moving away from the initial mm -hmm. of helping, but as soon as you start handling money, exactly. I think the that value, all of a sudden, that, eyebrows are really dead. What the evidence pointed to most was the fact that that just lended to a corruptive aspect where they were selective in interacting with patriarchs and, and the Pope. I think that, like I said, when it benefited them the most, they were all for it. But when it was in direct, in, uh, it was in direct contrast to what they wanted. It was like, let's just scoot that under the rug. Let's, yeah. let's kind of keep it quiet. Other questions? Here's a follow up conspiracy. Um, <laughs> um, is there any sense uh, as to how these people were seen by their common moments in the situation where, uh, as you mentioned, for instance, that they were paraded through the streets and this added to their humiliation mm -hmm. not because they know that they're supposed to be celebrated at that time. Good was, question. That was actually in. Um, there was, I believe it was in the Fordham source book, um, it outlined Saladin's perspective of the Battle of Hattin um, in Jerusalem. And that was primarily, the parading, parading them around was primarily to dissuade anyone else from joining the movement. And that was because they were seen as so powerful. Um, and that I also touched on the humiliation theme and the fact that if this was done to show that you guys think this order is big and bad and they can fight anybody and they can uh, combat anybody in battle. But in reality, we have them walking around and we're beheading them in the streets. And I think that, that points to that. Yeah. <laughs> Michael, just um, you talk, you speak of kind of a, a gradual movement. But there was there any particular uh, these uh, mil military religious orders were all led by um, individuals. There was a master of the order. Um, was there any one or two that were particularly awful or 
troubling when it comes to the original stated orders, original stated ideals of the order? Um, from research, I would say that that it would be situational, if that, if that makes sense. It's, um, so I think at the beginning, every leader was involved and they wanted to remain um, intact with that original purpose. I think, uh, like Dr. Nelson mentioned, as soon as you see money involved, that's where you see similar, uh, yeah, that's where you see changes within that mm. leadership. Um, I think the biggest would be during that 13th century, a lot of the leaders were focused on that because crusades were being launched more and more. You have the end of the third crusade, moving into the fourth, then you have the fifth, and then you have battles such as Laforby and uh, Jerusalem, where, I mean, Jerusalem's being attacked head on from different angles. I think that's where you would see um, that, that biggest uh, transition from a good leader to a not so good leader and back and forth. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Hearing none from this crowd and seeing none on the chat, uh, we will thank you, Michael. All right. Uh, well, well, hang on. Hang on one second. Hard. Give it. Give it a couple minutes because people are joining gotcha. still. So. <laughs> Would he be a? <clears throat> yeah. I think we can go ahead and go. Uh, next up, Tanner Wilhelm will be presenting Women uh, of the Crusading Era. Well, as uh, Michael said, my cap song uh, relates to Women of the Crusading Era. And more specifically, what I wanted to find out was did women possess the agency to affect the Crusades in the 11th through 14th century? And if so, what roles did women play in society that provided them the opportunity to do so? After looking at the evidence of primary documents, my thesis is that women, regardless of class or geographical location, possess the agency to affect the Crusades in the 11th and 14th century, both directly and indirectly by supporting the Crusades and being actively involved in the leadership of the affected regions. Before I get into the evidence to support my thesis, it's important to understand that the historical context of the time, um, the historical context uh, in relation to women. Uh, this was a time of uh, serious disintegration in Christendom's eastern frontier. This was largely due uh, to the encroachment of Turks and other Islamic groups um, onto uh, the eastern front of, of Christendom's frontier. Uh, most, most specifically is the encroachment of Jerusalem and uh, Islamic people taking control of Jerusalem. This was also a time of religious reform and this was a time where monastic leaders uh, and religious leaders were searching for a pure way to live life and sort of denouncing earthly things and living more pure for God. Uh, due to these things, uh, Pope Urban II decided in 1095 at the Council of Claremont that he would begin to preach and promote uh, the idea of the crusade with two primary goals in mind. The first, to free the Eastern Christians or the church from the oppression of the Muslims in Jerusalem, and secondly, to actually liberate the city of Jerusalem. Uh, seeing as which Jerusalem was a highly significant place for the Christian faith. Now, there are also two reasons, two main reasons why uh, men chose to take the pilgrimage uh, to Jerusalem. One uh, first reason was the idea of indulgences granted by the Pope, and the idea that uh, the pilgrimage served as a penance to uh, forgive the people of the sins. And the second was still just this idea of Jerusalem being um, a holy place, this, seeing as this was a place that, uh, where Jesus Christ was crucified, uh, crucified, crucified uh, and risen from the grave. And also did a lot of preaching there. This uh, city just had a lot of holy significance uh, to the Christian people. Uh, the reasons why women chose to participate in the pilgrimage are uh, pretty close to the same as men, uh, women, Decided to crusade and go on the pilgrimage for spiritual and earthly rewards. 
and Canada lawyers and legislators determined that women's vows were as equally as valid as men's vows, as men's vows to pilgrimage. So there was really nothing that could stop these women from uh, participating in the pilgrimage. Um, there were some social and economic factors of this time uh, that are important to keep in mind. Uh, this was a time of reoccurring famines. Um, there was also agricultural strain due to the increasing population uh, besides in uh, Christendom's eastern frontier or western frontier. Uh, land inheritance was also becoming a problem as the western frontier was holding on to this sort of Carolingian style of inheritance where uh, land and uh, property was distributed to uh, all the other siblings and uh, was pieced out between the family and as we move toward the 12th century, uh, we can see that this has kind of moved from uh, this Carolingian style to a top of inheritance where typically the eldest son would receive most of the inheritance. Thus, crusading um, actually acted as sort of a safety valve for younger siblings looking to, uh, or for siblings that possibly didn't have much or were not gaining, uh, or was not earning the inheritance. And the crusade uh, kind of offered them a way out of this life. Um, it's important to note that crusading was a male activity. Um, this is what Pope Urban II had intended for it. Um, and it's important to note that crusade was a pilgrimage as well as a holy war. So men were needed to fight um, to go into battle against the Muslims uh, and on these campaigns. And uh, due to this, women were often blamed for failures along campaigns. If uh, a battle was lost or uh, a campaign failed, uh, it would also what we see in the writings that these women were often blamed for failures due to their uh, immoralities and their uh, the, the idea that they were the weaker sex. The context of primary sources is also important as most of the uh, writings we have about women um, or anything related to women uh, is typically written by male authors from this time from a male perspective. Uh, and what we can see is that most of the writings about women uh, typically portrayed uh, this sort of ideal women, uh, an ideal woman, uh, in the sense that male writers were writing about women when they were doing something that was considered good for them to be doing. Um, likewise, they would also write about women whenever women were doing something that was considered uh, wrong, and not good. So what we really see um, in the writing is more uh, kind of a stereotypical style of these women, a representation of these women. For the historiography uh, portion, I decided to look at Shuam Mishra's The Fourth Estate for Women, and his, a history of women in the Middle Ages, and Heather Tanner's uh, Medieval Elite Women and the Exercise of Power. And what Shuam Mishra argues is that basically women collectively fell under what she calls a fourth estate, meaning that regardless of the woman's social class or where she fell on the hierarchy, uh, women as a whole fell collectively under men into this fourth estate. Where Heather Tanner argues that elite women uh, in position of power was very common during this time. Uh, one of the first arguments is the analysis of primary documents, where Heather Tanner argues that the gendering of specific words such as agency and influence are um, attributed to this sort of soft power. However, she says that this soft power can be just as influential, uh, can be just as imp impactful as hard power. Uh, one of the examples she gives is if, uh, if a husband was going to the crusade, and if the wife told the husband to go on a crusade and the husband went on the crusade, well, is that the husband's decision? Is he the one doing that? Or is that the wife telling the husband to do that? Um, uh, Shulamesh Sharar um, combats this by saying that, uh, no, that gender specific laws such as women becoming, uh, not being allowed to become lawyers, judges, or hold political offices during this time is evidence that women, yes, did indeed fall under this collective form of state. Uh, both authors discuss women as regents or the head of household. Um, what we see is that women were often left behind uh, to be in control of family possessions and the estate while the husband went uh, away uh, on the crusade. And what Heather Tanner argues is that these women were in a considerable amount of power uh, under this role as regent or head of household, and that they would be in charge of uh, the family's possession and finances and, uh, and other things related to the family. However, Shula Mishra uh, notes that most of the instances we have uh, 
of this, we see that the husband often left instructions for the wife to follow, um, such as how to handle the finances, how to handle the land, and how to generally overall manage uh, the estate. Uh, both, also, both authors discuss uh, the reasoning for women to take the veil or to join a convent or a monastery. Uh, Sharar uh, used this uh, as evidence for her argument that the women found her fourth state by saying that the reason for, for these women joining these convents or monasteries was to increase their freedom, their education, and their social status. And she's basically arguing that uh, in the patriarchal society that these women lived in, there was no real uh, there was no real opportunity for them to uh, increase their freedom and education and social status. And that the only way that they could actually do this was by joining these monasteries, joining the convent, or uh, becoming a nun. Heather Tanner points out the, uh, the uh, significant donations uh, and the buying of land that these monasteries did to support the Crusades. Uh, she notes that uh, many knights and lords would often sell their land uh, in order to uh, raise money to uh, support their uh, crusade. And Heather Tanner notes that uh, there was these monasteries that would often buy up uh, this land uh, and was sort of an indirect support to the crusade. <clears throat> In conclusion, Heather Tanner argues that uh, through this revised definition of power, by looking at uh, powers as, by looking at this soft power as not particularly soft power, but as just as impactful as hard power, that there were women in elite positions of power during this time. However, there's just more evidence uh, that Shul and Shalar provides that uh, women collectively fell under this fourth estate that was blown in from the uh, gender specific laws, uh, keep things such as the monastery. However, this does not mean that even though these women fell under this fourth estate, that they could not impact the crusades. For the evidence portion to support my thesis, I broke in my evidence up into two categories. Uh, and that is, how, can women, how did women affect the Crusades directly, and how did the women affect the Crusades indirectly? One of the most prominent examples of women uh, having an effect on the Crusade indirectly was, uh, was the women having the, that role of head of household. Um, as I said before, these women were in control of servants, uh, relatives, uh, and the finances of the house, and they were often, and they were also charged with defending against threats uh, to the families of state. Uh, these women were crucial to the popularity of the crusade as uh, they were able to stay home and maintain society in the West so that the men would be able to go to the East uh, to crusade. And this was uh, had a pretty large uh, indirect uh, impact on the crusade. Um, the second sort of uh, indirect way that women affected the Crusades was through encouragement and support of the Crusade. Pope Urban II encouraged uh, men to receive consent from his wife, but what we mainly see is that uh, most wives and mothers were encouraging their husbands and sons to go. Uh, the most prominent example of this is Belle of England encouraging her husband, Stephen O'Boy, to return to the Crusade after his failure at Antioch. Order it, Vitalis records this instance and says, Stephen was compelled both by fear and shame to undertake a fresh crusade. Among others, his wife had bailed off and urged him to it. Far be it from me, my lord, she says, to submit any longer to the job you receive from all quarters. Work up your courage for which you will be in your youth and take arms in a noble cause for the salvation of houses. So we can actually see um, from this document that the kind of agency and persuasion she had over her husband, she was able to uh, convince him to go on this second crusade, even after the uh, failure of the first one. Um, other examples of encouragement, uh, the itinerary of Peregrinorum, a guest of Richard Party, uh, notes that mothers and brides would incite husbands and sons to go. The anonymous author of the guest of Rekora uh, writes about women in Ikea carrying uh, water to men and offer comforting words that encourage exhausted soldiers. So here we see an example of a direct impact to the crusade uh, such as women carrying the water uh, to the men and also an indirect form uh, of women comforting the, the exhausted soldiers. <clears throat> women were also uh, beneficial in financing the crusades and impactful. Uh, Geoffrey Day and Saul records that women, that those at home in the West paid tithes of their property to, crusade, uh, to the crusade movement. And as I said before, it was mostly these uh, wives and women that were left at home uh, they were controlling the finances to pay these tasks. 
and thus uh, supporting the crusade indirectly. Uh, as I mentioned, monasteries will purchase or mortgage uh, land being sold by crusaders or uh, knights uh, to support their crusade. And it was these monasteries that were, that were buying up this land and uh, thus indirectly supporting the crusade. Uh, later in the Crusades, uh, John Gower writes in his uh, Mira de Long in 1376 through 1379. Uh, he writes about Crusaders taking their journey for pride and win over women. What we see here is these Crusaders moving more from uh, a religious appeal to a religious reasoning in crusading to actually crusading for earthly, uh, for earthly things and particularly women. And so in this case, women were impacting the crusade indirectly simply by being desirable to men. Uh, and men were encouraged by these women to actually go on the crusade. Now, for uh, the direct impact that women had on the crusade, uh, again, one of the most prominent examples I can think of or that I found was uh, the woman who threw herself into a trench. And basically, there was uh, this crusader army who was working to fill in a ditch um, and there was a woman who was carrying uh, buckets of soil or whatever else to help fill in this uh, trench. Geoffrey David, David Saw said that she worked tirelessly, encouraged everyone around her to complete the, complete her work, complete the work. Anyways, while she was doing this, um, a Turk, it's, it's recorded that a Turk rose up from the trench and fatally wounded her uh, with a dart. And upon her final dying request, uh, request she asked that she be laid into the trench so that her body would become part of it and that she would become part of the work still. Um, so this is just a great example of one woman directly having an impact on the crusade. Uh, Peter the Hermit, his uh, crusade was a little bit different uh, from the rest of the crusades as uh, all the wealthy would join him, uh, including women, children, uh, anybody that wanted to go on this crusade. And what we see is that writers often depict these women uh, as one of the main reasons for the failure of this crusade. Um, and while this is a negative effect for women, it still had an effect on the crusade as this sort of set a precedent uh, that women should not go on the crusades. Uh, the women were uh, related to this uh, immoralness uh, that would bring uh, bad things upon the crusade. Um, women in battle, uh, having an effect in battle, uh, the itinerary and pair of Grimoire and Gessrich Cordy writes that after a naval battle, the women dragged the Turks on shore by the hair and humiliated them, eventually decapitated them. And uh, this is just an example of women in battle uh, directly impacting the crusade um, through that role as a, I'm not sure if it would be a warrior, but uh, just being there in the campaign. Uh, there's another example of King Richard who encouraged his army to leave Acre and that no women could come except for the washerwomen. Uh, and the reason that no women were allowed to come was due to this idea that women were the weaker sex, uh, both spiritually and physically. Uh, women would do nothing but simply hold the crusade back was this idea of the stomp and that there would bring, uh, and that there would bring uh, bad things into camp and immoralities into camp. Uh, it's important to note that the washerwomen were allowed to come because they were essential to the cleanliness of the army and just the overall hockey of uh, the army as they could allow soldiers uh, clean uh, clothes and things of that nature. So they were very important uh, to the crusade. Um, there's a few elite women I wanna talk about that had a direct impact on the crusade. The first is Queen Margaret of France. Um, she was left in charge of Demiette in 1255 as her husband campaigned to Cairo. However, uh, after her husband's defeat in Cairo, uh, the Italian merchant community she was overseeing wanted to abandon Demiette and return home. However, Margaret was able to talk to the Italian consuls and convince the Italians to stay in Demiette and wait for the king. And, and uh, in successfully doing so, she uh, she was able to secure the French army and basically save the entire French army. Um, the second, Alice of Antioch. Alice of Antioch attempted to take control of the Antioch Principality three times after her husband died, William II. Um, after her first attempt, uh, William Baldwin II had granted her Latakia and Jabala. Um, and what's really uh, significant about this 
uh, instance is that from the charters we find uh, from her, she refers to herself as the princess of Hancock. And what we normally see from this time is charters either having the king and queen's name on it or just the king's. But the fact that she refers to herself as Princess of Antioch in this July charters kind of shows this agency and this power that she had in the area. And now how she affected the Crusades um, is also sort of a negative effect, but still an effect none the least. Uh, Kamal Adin wrote that due to the quarreling, the Muslims were able to successfully attack the towns of al Atharib and Barat Mesrib. So while she was causing this unrest, uh, in Antioch as she was trying to take control of the principality, uh, it created a very vulnerable state for Antioch. Um, and thus we can see that the towns of al Atharib and Barakamis were lost uh, due to this conflict. Uh, from my selected bibliography, uh, I chose to use uh, from my primary The Chronicles of Crusade by Henry Vaughn. And this is basically just a compilation of primary documents, charters, and several other sources from this uh, time period. Uh, Helen Nichols, Nicholson, the Chronicle of the Third Crusade, uh, Crusades in Translation. This is uh, basically follows the Third Crusade and King Richard's uh, Crusades. Uh, for my secondary, Natasha Hodgson, Women Crusade in the Whole Land and Historical Narrative. This story talks about uh, women in the historical narrative uh, of this time and uh, people, people of the First Crusade by Michael Foss. Uh, this is, uh, again, kind of a collection of primary sources, but also offers historical context and sort of an annotated uh, version of these primary documents. Yeah. Okay, I'd like to invite the audience to ask questions and those who are online to submit their questions using the chat feature. I'll read them to Tanner. Question? Um, oh, really interesting, really interesting research. And this, this question actually goes beyond the scope of your research. So if you don't know, I, I completely get it. Um, I, I'm wondering if this, this agency that you detect among these the, the women, um, did, you, did you run across at all any reaction to that among Western institutions in particular? You know, again, it goes beyond what you're looking at, but I was, I was wondering if the church, in response to these, you know, examples that you have of women, you know, exerting a power that you know, is traditionally has not been accepted, um, I'm wondering if, if you see any sort of reaction to that in the church. Um, not that I've seen, um, as far as from the church. Um, I thought about actually looking at uh, some Muslim sources and uh, trying to go that route to looking at how they viewed the Christian women. Uh, but it's just, there's the evidence for women during this time is pretty scarce. Uh, like I said, most of the time when we hear about women from this area, it's written by men. Um, and there's just, there's just really a lack of evidence in that area. So I'm not, I'm not really sure. No, sir. Which speaks to the to the resistance of giving women mm -hmm. this sort of agency. I mean, what gets published, what voices right. get heard, or obviously a decision is made. Yeah. Well, and that's related to a question that I had, and I have two questions. But this first, if you could go back to your thesis statement, if you would mind. Because in looking at your thesis, um, oh, sorry, we could go back to the research question. Because the research question is, did women possess the agency to affect the crusades? Well, of course women possess agency. Do you know what I mean? So like the women, all human beings possess agency. Do you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Yes, ma'am. But you, you have to talk about the societal factors that prohibited them from acting on that agency. Right. You know what I mean? Yes, and, and that you do that, you do a good job of that. But that to me, with the research question it needed to be reformulated a little bit because the way you present it here suggests that women didn't possess an agency but they did they just weren't allowed to act upon it by the oppressive patriarchal institutions in which they live right. which you talked about you know and i was trying to look at sort of uh like what kind of agents like the to the scale that, that, that they had this agency but also i want to look at what societal roles allowed them greater agency exactly. or more, uh, 
you know, being able to attack the crusades differently. And you're Thanks noting of the differences between class, right? That we made up upper classes were better able to right. or allowed to act upon that agency. I think is an important point to keep this mind. But then my other question for you is this, and again, this you might not have read about this at all, but usually um during the crusades and during any period where there is looting and pillaging, there's also rape. Mm -hmm. Um, and did you come across any discussions of rape or incidents of rape that were, I mean, occurring? Uh, yes, I did. Most, mostly what I saw would be, say, if the Christians lost in battle, it would be the Muslims raping. Or if, from the Muslims' point of view, it would be the Christians right. raping. Right. So what uh, typically in that area, we would see from the opposition writing about uh, whoever raping their women yeah yeah and things of that nature yeah. uh, but what i mainly saw a lot of was just this uh idea that women were sort of just an immorality to the camp right uh, and that they were just a weakness both spiritually and physically yeah um, they would just be a hindrance on the camp well and one would wonder too what the role of rape played in as a tool right to um, oppression mm -hmm. either by christians or the muslims and a further exemplification of the way in which women are seen as not only the lesser sex mm -hmm. among both of these populations, but also again rape as a way as a tool to kind of humiliate um, the other side, right. right? And the way that women were often the victims yes, um, of these power struggles, right? Well, can I jump in with a couple of chat questions before we lose? Um, Dr. Campbell asks. Uh, how did your interest in this topic develop? Uh, well, uh, oh, my camera. well, I know I'd just taken a Dr. Summers class. It was, was kind of, it was pretty fresh on my mind. And then yeah. you know, we just were talking about topics in the crusade. I just was really just trying to think of what I could do and uh, started looking into women and uh, saw that there wasn't a whole lot done on this topic. So I just kind of stuck with it and formed a question and ran with it pretty much that's all right and then uh dr wilkins asked to provide asked you to provide a definition of agency of uh, agency will yeah. um well uh so basically what agency is the ability to uh, influence persuade somebody just to have uh, it's not necessarily power uh but it's sort of it kind of is it's this uh, influence over another person Okay, Dr. Harris, I'm sorry to. Yeah, so Dr. Campbell, I should apologize also, but basically, <laughs> same sort of question, because I, I recently read from my uh, American slavery class a book called um, They Were Her Property. It's a new book that looks at white women as slaveholders. Um, and just this idea that <coughs> what you about the presence of women, as you said, in agency. Um, but they're they're previously there as well, but they're just invisible, right? Mm -hmm. They're they're just not seen um, with that hard power, soft power, as you said. So I was curious about the same thing in terms of how you got to this question, right? Um, if you don't see them, where are you actually starting? What's your starting point to get to the point where you want to know? Is it just that you're trying to figure out why they're not there, or uh, or are you catching a little? Bits of them as you read about other topics, etc. That was pretty much uh, how I gathered my information. Was you just get these little clips of women uh, within the within the primary documents, and uh, I just really wanted to determine. And I, well, I began to think about queens and uh, women that just went on the pilgrimage, okay. and then I got me thinking. Uh, well, who had a more of an impact on the crusade? Was it some of these queens that were able to? Uh, impact it more directly themselves, or it was these women that were actually on the crusade, uh, did they have a greater impact? And then I just kind of worked my way through that question. Um, and as looking at evidence, I just more kind of refined my question further and further until I got to the to this question that I liked, uh, just inquiring if women had the agency to affect the crusades through the 11th to 14th century, and what societal roles allowed them to do this. So uh, again, like I said, there's not a whole lot of evidence that's just about women or written by women. Um, so 
really, I just have to look at a whole compilation of, of evidence and bond the women where I can. Um, do it that way. Yes. Yeah, I love your uh, presentation, but the topic itself is fascinating. You know, we really don't really get a lot of that at all. And for the most part, it's through the eyes of men in order to see what women are actually doing, you know, either admiring that or finding it interesting enough to comment on these uh, women. Um, I think, you know, I have very little of the experience or knowledge about this period, but in my work, it's been down. We actually look specifically at primary sources from the crusade as well as some points. And as a, as a comment, basically, I thought it was interesting how this might pertain to you because there was one um, letter that the crusader sent back to his wife mm -hmm. telling her that she should be proud of him because he now will bring back twice as much gold as she told him to get. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. So she gives me courage, diligent, so and bringing home gold, you know. So he packs the whole thing full of gold, you know, and writes back. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, like, you will love me even more when I come back. <laughs> yeah, I think what you're talking about. Yeah, uh, there actually is uh, several letters uh, between crusaders and uh, to their wives and women. I've used that as well uh, in my research. But yeah. Any other questions? Thank you, Tanner. <laughs> and uh, that concludes our uh, capstone presentations, as well as our honors project presentation. The panel is completed. Congratulations, everybody. Uh, <laughs>